Jenny Mena. You join us today with a great depth of experience, including in the public sector at DHS and in the private sector, both in financial services at US Bank and currently in healthcare, where you serve as Vice President for Business Security Risk at Humana. Jenny, what do you see as the core drivers of the current cybersecurity challenge? You know, some of it is really that people and companies are not prioritizing cybersecurity, whether it is, um, you know, as individual employees where we are not being vigilant, you know, watching out for those phishing emails, whether it is failure to follow the, you know, kind of the basic cyber hygiene rules and practices. And as companies, we face trade-offs, just like in any other risk that we assess as a company. Um, we are trading off all of us leverage technology. How are we prioritizing security versus speed, whether we're, we're launching a new app, um, whether we're trying to reduce friction for our customers? We need to balance those things with cybersecurity. How quickly do we choose to roll out a critical patch to a vulnerability that comes out. Those things can have consequences. They can result in operational impacts if they don't go well, which those of us who've been in the business while know sometimes they don't. So how do we prioritize? How do we bring together um, the cybersecurity experts, the IT organization and our business partners to understand how to reduce the cybersecurity risks and still enable the business? How do we communicate up to the senior leadership teams and the board of directors of why this is important, why the investment matters? Um, you know, that's a big part of it. As I said, companies have not properly resourced, prioritized the issue. We see that a lot in the news. Can you elaborate on the role of cyber hygiene? We don't always do all the things that are, are known good hygiene practices in cyberspace. Um, and, and that's coupled with, right, we're not doing the, the things that we can do to protect ourselves. At the same time, we're increasingly dependent on technology. We're using it in different ways. We are interconnected with partners, um, third parties, fourth parties, um, leveraging APIs um, with partners. We're, we're doing all different things from healthcare, um, to other kinds of operational technology and critical infrastructure, the financial sector. We're doing everything in our lives, both personal and professional, leveraging cyberspace. And so the fact that there's not always good security hygiene in place, everything is, is happening there. That's where the money is, literally. That's where the information that we hold most dear, the functions that we rely upon in our lives, all sit, we shouldn't be surprised that that makes us an attractive target to an increasingly diverse and sophisticated group of, of bad guys and girls um, overseas. And so those cyber criminal groups have grown and matured. They work much like large companies in some cases where they have you know customer service and HR and, and business plans. They, I was reading an article today about um, cybercrime groups coming together to form a cartel to share resources and expertise and infrastructure. Um, they've also kind of democratized the ability to launch attacks with ransomware as a service. You don't have to be the most technologically sophisticated if you can buy, um, again, ransomware as a service along with user training um, and money back guarantees that allows more people to get into the cybercrime business. Um, cryptocurrency, which is difficult if not impossible to trace, allows these ransomware actors to demand to be paid um, and a way for them to do it with a, a good degree of anonymity and safety. Um, and, and then of course, again, why, why would they not leverage cyberspace? Um, because that's where, that's where the money is, um, that's where the information is, that's where they can really hurt us and say, you know, pay us the ransom because of everything that we're doing online. Um, you know, we talk about nation states, we talk about the advanced persistent threat. So we are not prioritizing cybersecurity in both the organizational and individual domains. How do we motivate the investment of time, effort, and other resources to change that? 
All right. Well, and again, you know, a lot of the basic cyber hygiene is not expensive. Um, I think sometimes people think there's a lot of expensive technology that they would have to buy, and that's daunting. And it really is those basics like patch what you have, um, don't have vulnerabilities that are known, just waiting there exposed. Um, watch out for phishing emails and educate your staff. These are not super expensive. Um, what is going to motivate people? That's a great question because I think those of us who've been in this business for a long time, each time there's one of these big attacks that gets to be more and more national news, we think this is finally it. This is going to be the tipping point. Um, and we certainly see some incremental improvements over time, but not the kind of forcing function, the aha moment you would think where everyone would come scrambling. Um, I do think that what happened with Colonial Pipeline made it very real for people um, who were sitting at gas stations. I think some of these recent um, supply chain issues where there were vendors that were compromised, um, even if you didn't leverage that vendor, just having to go through the analysis of, okay, you know, do we use solar winds? Okay, well, if we don't do any of our subsidiaries um, or joint ventures. Um, what about our key suppliers, contractors? Are they using them? Um, you know, just the amount of effort that we go through when there's something that we don't even use um, running down that process, I think is has made people aware um, of the importance of understanding your technology landscape um, and understanding your critical vendor list as well. Okay. So how does this get effectively communicated to the powers that be in the corporation? So the appropriate policies, procedures are put in place and investments are made. I think one of the most um, valuable skills for a cybersecurity leader, whether it's a CISO or another key position um, advocating for reducing cyber risk in your company, is the ability to explain the, the challenges and the risks in terms that resonate with the business. Um, I think often we can get into the minutia of different, you know, funny named actor groups and TTPs and, and things that mean something to cybersecurity professionals, but that kind of make the, the business people's eyes glaze over. And so one of the things that we need to do is to translate into terms, um, you know, board CEOs, they understand the concept of risk. So how do we explain the cybersecurity risk in, in words, in concepts, in stories that resonate with them? Um, you know, as we talk about what would happen to our business, if the confidentiality of information, obviously I'm at a healthcare company that, you know, your healthcare information, um, I think for some is more sensitive than your financial information. Other people would probably argue the other way, but those are probably the two most sensitive um, sets of information that we have um, about ourselves. So obviously confidentiality is extremely critical. Um, when And then we have to look at the other pieces. So we have to protect our customers' confidential information. Um, there are also regulations that, that require that, rightly. Um, there's the integrity piece. What would happen to our business um, in the functions, again, that we provide to our customers, whether it's um, clinical services, um, whether it is insurance, whether it's um, you know filling the bottles in a, a pharmacy, a mail order pharmacy? What if the integrity of the information that we have couldn't be trusted? And then you get to that third piece of the availability. What would we do if we couldn't access medical records, if we couldn't access billing information, if we were unable to, you know, there's, if you walk through with the business, you know, what if we were unable to have these functions that we rely upon to execute our core corporate mission you know, sitting down, having a tabletop exercise where you talk through what what would happen, what would we do um, if we were directly impacted by, say, ransomware? What would that mean to our company, to our customers? How would we escalate? Who would we bring in and when? Um, I think those conversations can make it very real. I think 
you know, again, over what we've gone through in the past year and a half with ransomware um, hitting partners in supply chains, what, who are those key partners and what would it do to our ability to deliver as a company if those partners suffered from ransomware um, is another excellent conversation. So again, it's really how do you explain the story in a way that resonates with the business? Um, you know, if there are ways to quantify, that's always good um, in terms of, of lost revenue, in terms of fines, certainly things that will help make that case. Um, but I do think it's it's telling that story is really critical and not going into the level of technical details where, again, people's eyes glaze over who don't love to do that for a living. Ginny, I know you're a strong advocate for collaboration, both on a business to business basis, as well as between business and government. Can you discuss how this comes into play? Absolutely. So I think the good news is you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, that is one of the wonderful things about the information sharing and analysis centers. Um, the FSI SAC, uh, Financial Services, is one of the most mature. Um, I think people realized quickly we were interconnected in the financial sector. And so we didn't compete on cybersecurity um, and came to the conclusion that if I detect today um, and share the information to you so that you can prevent tomorrow if you detect first, um, then I can prevent. And it's really kind of a reciprocal process. And certainly they're sharing threat indicators, but also the best practices rather than everybody trying to figure out, uh, what do I do about this? Um, really sharing that information about what's happening, um, whether it's, you know, watch out for this email address um, or whether it's this is a way to fix a problem and fix it quickly that I have discovered. Um, I think there is tremendous benefit in collaboration and sharing and, and good ideas from the people that are all trying to do the same job in partner organizations. So I think the healthcare ISAC, the financial services ISAC, um, we are also members of the national defense ISAC. Um, another phenomenal, again, not just threat, but best practice sharing organization, um, extremely helpful. Um, there are, for those who are not in kind of the big companies that really play traditionally in the ISAC space, there are also great organizations like the National Cybersecurity Alliance um, that share, again, those kind of hygiene best practices, um, links to tools, things you can do that are either free or not very expensive. It's not going out and buying the, the shiny bells and whistles. Um, but again, not having to figure it out yourself. We've talked a lot about corporate activities so far. What do you see as the role of government in advancing cybersecurity? The federal government has a lot of resources. Um, they are they have our intelligence capability. We do not have a, you know, even the biggest US companies don't really have a signals intelligent capability like NSA has. We don't have a, a military cyber command branch. Um, and so we need to leverage the, the capabilities that are uniquely government, um, inherently government functions, whether it is cyber command protecting us and going after some of these actors, um, the FBI, um, you know, and and the, the Justice Department finding and prosecuting the criminals who are conducting some of these attacks um, using the other instruments of, of national power, whether it's sanctions, whether it is the State Department um, negotiating with other countries about criminal behavior taking place within their borders or, frankly, nation state directed activity directly. Um, you know, we need all of those pieces of government, but we also recognize that, you know, the government has two other advantages. Um, one, they are, you know, those of us who are a little bit older remember watching war games, they are the original hacking target. Um, and so they have lots of experience in, you know, seeing what the adversaries are doing and sharing. Um, this is what we're seeing and this is what you can do about it. So while we benefit from the intelligence that comes from the signal intelligence community about the, the threat actors, we can also learn a lot from just how the government is protecting itself um, because it has such a varied attack service and enticing set of targets. Um, the government also has a lot of uh, purchasing power. And so one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the IT solutions that we all rely on. Are they being built to be secure? Again, was, was that the priority? Um, is it building security in? Um, is it safety and security features? 
or is it other features? Is it it's speed and bells and whistles? Um, and we need to have our federal government use some of its purchasing power to drive a an, an IT provider solution set for all of us that is more secure. You just mentioned using purchasing power to drive cybersecurity. Can you elaborate both for the public and private sectors? You know, there's been a lot of talk over the years of trying to come up with a good housekeeping seal um, for products, uh, you know, maybe in Internet of Things products, for example. I don't know um, how long it's going to take to get there. It's certainly the security of medical devices is top of mind for us in our industry and probably for everyone who has health personal health concerns of their own. Um, out there, I am, you know, the question is who implements that? Is it a private sector body, um, which I know the chamber has advocated for over time? Is it some sort of a government agency giving that seal of approval? You know, with many of these solutions, there, there are pros and cons and, and complications. And so we've gone back and forth for many years, struggling to figure out how do you get there? Um, you know, certainly as the government makes changes to um, to the FAR, um, DOD to the DFAR, their contract requirements, again, because of just the size of how much they buy, can have an impact. Um, I know that, for example, the multi-state ISAC has provided recommended contract terms around cybersecurity for state and local government to use. We as companies also spend a lot of money um, and we should be focusing at on what are the terms of the contract, what do our information security agreements look like um, when we do business with a company, um, what kind of assessment are we doing of their security practices to make sure that they're in fact um, implementing good cyber hygiene and protecting our information. Uh, and then how do we regularly revisit the security of those key partners and vendors through a variety of different means, whether it's security monitoring services, whether it's you know kind of regular um, reassessments, whether it's you know finding a, a way to get out quickly and get responses quickly to make sure that all of the the key vendors have addressed a, a critical vulnerability. Jenny, what do you see as the big picture ideas and challenges in cybersecurity going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing, again, when we think about some of those big picture ideas, how do we make security easier? Um, how do we make it easier for companies that don't have the resources um, that, that some of the big companies that you're interviewing for this video have, that government agencies have? Um, and, and how do we make it easier for everybody to, again, when a, a vulnerability is discovered, to patch more quickly in a way that's it's safer? How do we build, again, security in at the beginning so you're not having to make those patches later um, that can cause operational impact and, and use a lot of resources, honestly, that you know could be spent on other aspects of security and on other kinds of technology innovation. I think we need to continue really with this. How do we, how do we as a community build awareness, um, build motivation, and keep it going, because we can get everybody really excited um, about cybersecurity. Everybody's thinking about it, talking about it again after something like Colonial Pipeline. But in six months, will it still be top of mind when we're talking about investment and some of the trade-off risk decisions? In closing then, what would be your call-outs to both business and government? So I would say for partners in the private sector, it's critical that you have the conversation that brings together not just the security people, um, the IT people, but also the business leaders and really have a business-based risk conversation about your current posture, what could happen to you on a bad day, and that what could happen needs to include the business conversation and jointly assess the risk and use that to prioritize mitigations and solutions. Um, also, again, you are not alone if you're not already active in something like an information sharing and analysis center or leveraging organizations like the National Cybersecurity Alliance, jump in. You're not the only company that's doing this. Everybody doesn't need to learn this on their own. Um, we can share best practices. We can share lessons learned. We can share information. 
um, and, and hopefully get ahead of this in a way that expends less resources. And to our government partners, um, I hope that this effort will, you know, there's been a lot of great work done over the years by the federal government. Sometimes it's in fits and starts, but there are some things that only the federal government can do, whether it's sharing the threat intelligence information that comes from the, the signals intelligence capability, whether it's law enforcement, um, and sharing the information that you have with the private sector partners, um, you know, is really critical for all of us working together to succeed. Mm -hmm.